we take for granted just how many masterpieces see the light of day. There are an unlimited amount of circumstances that can and will hinder projects from realizing their full potential. For every great piece of art we get to appreciate, there exist thousands that never got their first step. But more relevant are those that did make it further, yet couldn't survive. That's because when tangible materials exist, we're able to glimpse into that alternate timeline and better ascertain just how great things could have been. That's what this video is about, looking back at the greatest art never made and what led to their fate. Maslow theorized that humans relied on a hierarchy of needs, of which needed to be satisfied before one could self-actualize. This model can also be applied to one's creative potential, with each stage representing a different confounding variable. This then defines those first roadblocks as being the most basic of needs, which in the context of film is the budget. Stanley Kubrick is remembered as one of the most meticulous directors in history. During filming for The Shining, he infamously forced actors to perform the staircase scene 127 times, highlighting just how adamant the director was to not compromise his vision. With the release of 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968, Kubrick made quite a name for himself. To this day, it's considered a landmark in science fiction for successfully depicting a grandness previously only imagined in literature. The techniques he pioneered have also since become staples of the genre. 2001 received five Oscar nominations that year, including one for Best Director. And it was only with that acclaim that Kubrick was able to leverage support from MGM for his next project, which would go on to be called The Greatest Movie Never Made. This is the story of Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon. As iterated before, Kubrick was an innovator. He always aspired to go one step beyond his peers. It was this determination that brought him to the pedestal of the French Emperor's legacy. Many had attempted to create films based on Napoleon in the past, but even the best failed to live up to his legend. At least, that's how Kubrick felt after personally reviewing every feature based on his life. Stanley wasn't just interested in retelling the story, though. Just as 2001 had aspired to be the first great sci-fi film, he sought to direct a historical epic like the world had never seen. So, for the next two years of his life, he began painstakingly researching for what would have been his three-hour-long masterpiece. Having now watched all the Napoleon films in existence, the director proceeded to read hundreds of different biographies. He then hired a renowned scholar, as well as 20 of their graduate students, to construct over 10,000 files on the 50 most important figures in the tactician's life. All this was to ensure the complexity he desired was retained, seeking to depict not just the emperor's legend, but his humanity, with an intense reflection upon the evil nature of man. It sounds cliché, but the director became so invested in the project that it literally became a part of him. His research was so exhaustive that he began mimicking the Emperor's habits. At one point, Kubrick read that the Frenchman was infamous for interrogating everyone he met. He reportedly mirrored this behavior for the rest of his life. During production for A Clockwork Orange, its lead actor recalled asking the director why he ate his steak and ice cream at the same time. Kubrick simply replied, what's the difference? It's all food. This is how Napoleon used to eat. Naturally, making a film like this wasn't going to be easy. From the very beginning, the director knew that its budget was going to be an issue. After all, the last historical epic, 1963's Cleopatra, was the most expensive movie ever made. Accounting for inflation, its budget would be the equivalent of over $380 million today, hence why it nearly bankrupt 20th Century Fox. With that in mind, he tried his best to balance feasibility, while still remaining true to his vision. The script had ambitious plans to depict the many battles Napoleon led accurately. Back then, the only way to accomplish this was with actual men. Surprisingly, he was able to find a solution, by employing 50,000 Romanian soldiers at the affordable cost of $2 per man a day. Then came the issue of costumes. To lower costs, he planned to utilize cheap outfits made of paper that were otherwise indistinguishable from cloth on camera. The production team was even able to negotiate terms to film in actual palaces throughout France and Italy, significantly reducing the need for set construction. It seemed as if Kubrick's vision only became more and more plausible. However, by the time pre-production had completed, a lot had changed. It'd been two years, and in that time, three other films about the Emperor had been released. This alone would be a detriment, but more importantly, they were all box office failures. The prospect of making a costly historical epic in an oversaturated market was unappealing. With their initial deal only agreeing to fund that developmental period, MGM decided not to move forward with Napoleon, and just like that, the project was shelved. Years of unbroken fascination, tens of thousands of research materials, the guidance of experts, logistics, even sending an assistant to literally follow Napoleon's footsteps. All thrown away because it just didn't seem like the right time. In the entertainment industry, time and money are inseparable. 
What does and doesn't get funded is often influenced by arbitrary industry trends. Napoleon wasn't cancelled due to a lack of faith, but the subject matter being viewed as tired. The same can't be said for other projects, however, with many deliberately altered to better fit what executives think will sell. One of the most famous and egregious examples of this is the story of Richard Williams and his film The Thief and the Cobbler. Richard Williams will be remembered as a legendary animator. Most well known for his work on 1988's Who Framed Roger Rabbit, he spent the later years of his life guiding young artists through the principles of his craft. This is what made The Thief and the Cobbler so special. It was intended to be his personal magnum opus, his masterpiece. When you, when you master a medium in the old days, if you were a master painter, then you did your masterpiece. Well, this is an old fashioned, I've, I've mastered this medium at last. And I'm going to do a masterpiece, I hope, if I can ever finish the thing. What's driving you to produce this masterpiece? Quest for excellence. Williams wanted to create the best animated film ever made, with ambitious sequences and three-dimensional camera work all intended to be done by hand. This went down to the frame rate, running at a full 24 per second, doubled the industry standard at the time. Having mastered the medium, the scenes he envisioned were feasible. But for what he had in skill, he lacked in resources. Those first two decades of development were rough. The film was self-funded and worked on only sparingly between commission. It was only after the success of Roger Rabbit that he was able to secure a deal with Warner Bros to finally enter full-scale production. One would expect this to be where the story uplifts, but instead it began the project's downfall. When Warner Bros. funded the film, it seemed like a dream come true. But when making a deal with a corporate entity, one almost necessitates some compromise of their vision. Williams' greatest downfall was not being able to meet deadlines. Previous attempts at funding fell through because of this. This new contract included a completion bond deal, ensuring they'd get a finished film. This meant that unlike before, the project would be completed, regardless of its state. Richard had agreed to do the impossible, and gave his masterpiece a deadline. In order to have it finished by 1991, the team had to begin staying overtime. His animators were working upwards of 60 hours a week, with many fired for not being able to keep up. But Williams was the hardest on himself. He was always the first to enter and last to exit the studio. With this strict new approach, the team was now making record pace, but unfortunately, even that wasn't enough. By the point of the deadline, there was still 10 to 15 minutes of screen time left incomplete. That may not sound like a lot, but this would have entailed at least another half a year of work. And to make matters worse, many of those scenes were vital to the central story. Upon seeing the rough cut of the movie, Warner Bros. were unimpressed. Losing confidence in the project, they refused to extend the deadline further, instead seizing control from Williams and transforming his magnum opus into a conventional animated film. Richard Williams spent 29 years slaving away, attempting to create an animated masterpiece like never before seen, only for it to be torn apart by executives and reconstructed into a critical and financial failure. He was so devastated by this that he tried his best to forget. It took him 20 years after its release to publicly acknowledge it again for the first time. Secondary to their basic needs is the artist's proclivity to express themselves. For one to be able to realize their full creative potential, they must believe in their own abilities. This takes us to the world of music. The Beach Boys have often been called one of the greatest bands of all time, rivaling that of the Beatles. And while their legacy never reached quite the same level as their British competitors, in a slightly different timeline, it could have. Before 1966, the Beach Boys were mostly known for hits such as I Get Around and Surf in USA. But that year, they did something no one expected and verged into psychedelic pop. To explain why they made such a drastic shift requires an in-depth look into their de facto leader, Brian Wilson. The band's 11th studio album, Pet Sounds, is considered one of the most influential in history. It's also jokingly referred to by fans as his solo album, because it's by and large his love child. Wilson became the driving creative force during those years, but the story of how he got there can only be described as tragic. A year before the album's recording, Brian's mental state began deteriorating. Flying around the world on tour, addicted to mind-altering drugs on top of untreated mental illnesses, severely damaged his psyche. It culminated into a nervous breakdown made a flight that caused him to quit touring altogether. During this time, he became so paranoid and antisocial that he refused to speak entirely. In one meeting with record executives, he only answered questions using a tape player he rigged to pronounce yes, no, or thank you. As the Beach Boys continued their tour, Brian secluded himself in his mansion. He was nearly at the point of quitting music altogether until he heard something that motivated him to do the exact opposite. Mission. 
1965, the Beatles released Rubber Soul, and immediately upon listening to it, Brian was enamored. In fact, he felt so inspired that the next morning, he wrote God Only Knows in less than an hour. Brian was obsessed with its quality, so much so that he dedicated that next year to composing his own cohesive art piece. A huge deviation from their previous work, the other band members had minimal input, with most of their contributions being in vocal harmony. Instead, Brian employed wordsmiths and session musicians to create the instrumentally dense record. It was released in 1966 to an initial lukewarm response, but the album did receive recognition from the people that mattered the most. When the Beatles listened to Pet Sounds, they were astonished. McCartney recalled in an interview being shocked by the sheer musical invention present, lost for a moment at what they should do. They were so impressed by Pet Sounds, in fact, that they took inspiration themselves, with the Revolver being made as a direct response. But this back and forth didn't end there. Upon hearing the Beatles' answer to Pet Sounds, Wilson became motivated to one-up them. He began conceptualizing what would eventually become known as Smile. I've been in this town so long. Smile was intended to be a concept album, with strong thematic cohesion from start to finish. This alone was unheard of at the time, but Wilson's innovation went further. He wanted to write songs that had multiple levels. This led him to begin recording tracks and segments, with the intent of eventually combining these fragments into a single composition. Unfortunately, this is where things began to collapse. In preparation, he purchased over $2,000 worth of marijuana. Consequently, these sessions became very surreal, with Wilson having several episodes, such as one occasion where he relocated his grand piano into a sandbox. As Brian's well-being only continued to decline, intense infighting sparked amongst the band as they failed to understand his vision. Most notable was the response from Mike Love, who chastised his experimentation. He believed that Wilson was going to destroy their livelihoods and wanted to simply create a commercially successful pop record epitomized in the famous quote, don't fuck with the formula. The track Heroes and Villains was meant to set up themes and motifs present for the entire project, but upon its release as a single, it failed to meet commercial or critical expectations. Jimi Hendrix at one point even publicly denounced them. Brian, already in a fragile state, was surrounded by people telling him to give up, and he didn't have anyone to say the contrary. The Beach Boys simply weren't as beloved as the Beatles, and while Wilson is considered now as one of the greatest, he received very little praise during his prime and began losing confidence in the project. For these reasons, Wilson contemplated giving up entirely. Van Dyke, responsible for much of the album's lyrics, even became alienated and left. Without that help, he began to lose track of how the fragments should be assembled, before cutting off communication with the band entirely, dictating that all of the material recorded for Smile was off-limits. The album was heavily neutered following these events, with much of its compositions discarded or redone to be simpler. Wilson released what was left in 1967 as Smiley Smile, which wasn't a bad album, but bittersweet in comparison to what could have been. Smile was intended to be his masterpiece, and had it been released, likely would have lived up to that expectation. The Beatles were producing a concept album of their own at the time, and what resulted is considered one of the most iconic and influential albums of the century. Paul McCartney, who described himself as the director of the album, even cited Pet Sounds as one of his greatest influences. Elements such as the Beach Boys' harmonic structure and choice of instruments encouraged the Beatles to experiment further. One of the greatest criticisms of Sgt. Pepper's is that despite being a concept album, that concept was under realized. Smile was going to be far more cohesive in that regard, and in the midst of the British invasion, opted to tell a grand narrative about America. If it had been released before Sgt. Pepper's, it likely would have cemented their place in the vanguard of rock, and one can only imagine then how the Beatles would have responded. Unfortunately, because Wilson lost confidence in himself and lacked stability, these can only remain hypotheticals. Every great artist is fighting for their magnum opus, and most lament the fear that they may never achieve it. While the cause of death for these projects differ, one common trait amongst them is that they're all the victims of circumstance. The ability for a masterpiece to defy all expectations and be released is part of what makes their existence so special. If there's one thing you should gather from this video, it's that shit happens. You're going to face issues beyond your control and it's scary to think about. But you have to keep trying. Because while the opportunity will disappear one day, your memory of it won't. This ain't creative, it's ruining my dreams. I know this class ain't turning out like what it seems. This ain't creative, it's ruining my future plans. It makes me want to sell my guitar and cut off both my hands.